So first of all, what is a wave? What has to be happening in order for us to call something a wave? Oscillations. Yeah, there's got to be some sort of oscillation. You've got to have uh, some either an object oscillating in space, or you've got to have some some quantity oscillating as time passes. Like for instance, in sound waves, one way you can describe that is pressure oscillations. As a sound wave passes by, if you can track, like for instance, the pressure of this point in space, it's oscillating between a little higher than atmospheric pressure and a little lower than atmospheric pressure, high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure, as time passes. But a wave is more than just oscillation because you can get oscillation in all sorts of phenomena. Like for instance, if you've got a pendulum swinging back and forth, that's oscillation. Or if you've got an object on a spring bouncing back and forth, that's oscillation. But that doesn't count as a wave. A wave is not just one object oscillating, it's lots of objects oscillating. For example, if you have a rope and you're just holding one end of the rope and wiggling it, you're not just making that piece of the rope oscillate, you're making the entire rope oscillate as time passes. But each point on the rope is oscillating in its own way. This point is oscillating up and down. And this other point is also oscillating up and down. They're oscillating up and down the same amount, but they're out of sync with each other. So each one of those points is gonna be having a different equation for its own oscillation. We could write, for instance, y as a function of t for this point and keep track of its motion up and down as time passes. And we could also write y as a function of t for this point, keep track of its motion up and down as time passes. And those would be very similar equations, but not exactly the same because they're oscillating out of sync with each other. So in order to get a complete equation of the wave, we need y as a function of not just t, but also what other variable? Yeah, we need to keep track of x. X is talking about how far along the rope we're talking about, or how far through the air, if we're talking about a sound wave, for instance. X represents position in the medium, position of in terms of how far the wave has traveled. So the y value, the height in this case, or in the case of a sound wave, maybe the pressure, depends on the location and what time it is. So you need both of those in order to keep track of a wave. A wave is talking about some quantity oscillating with position and time. Y representing maybe the height of a point on the rope or the depth of water, if you're talking about water waves, or the pressure at a point in the air, if you're talking about sound waves. You can have a variety of different things oscillating but a wave function is gonna to have to involve a, a function of position and time. And if you look at it in terms of position, you can make an X versus Y graph. An X versus Y graph is gonna be just the shape of the rope at that instant in time. Because in an X versus Y graph, we're assuming it's at one specific time. So for the X versus Y graph, we're assuming we're just freezing time. We're looking at like a, a, still, a still single frame paused on a video. If you take a video of the wave traveling and then press pause, at that instant, the wave is gonna have a sinusoidal shape. So the X versus Y graph is gonna be some sort of sine function. But the thing is we can also get a T versus Y graph. The X versus Y graph is only, is showing all X values but only one specific time. What do you think the T versus Y graph would be representing? If we were to draw a graph of T versus Y, what would that be talking about? Yeah, that's at one specific position. The X versus Y graph is talking about all X values, in other words, the whole rope, but only one specific time. We're just freezing the video at one or pausing the video at one instant. Whereas the T versus Y graph, we're talking about all time. We're allowing time to pass, but we're only looking at one specific position. 
So we might, for instance, look at, let's say, just this point on the rope. As time passes, that one point is just going to be oscillating up and down and up and down and up and down. It's not moving forward or backward at all. It, this one in particular is just oscillating up and down. But if you graph its oscillations as time passes, that's also going to be a sine function. It's not going to be the same sine function. It's not going to be the same graph but it will still be a sinusoidal function because the object is oscillating. That point on the rope is oscillating up and down and up and down as time passes. So the T versus Y graph is looking at the history of one single location on the rope. The X versus Y graph is looking at one single instant in time of all locations on the rope. And in this case, the X versus Y graph is literally just the shape of the rope at that instant in time. Of course, Y doesn't have to represent height. Y might represent pressure in a sound wave or in a longitudinal wave. If everything's oscillating forward and backward, Y would actually represent how far forward or backward from equilibrium each point is. But in this case, a transverse wave where the oscillations are perpendicular to the motion of the wave, the, the direction of travel, the Y versus X graph really is just the shape of the wave. Any questions on that so far? So we want to make a sine function. It's going to have to involve t and x somehow. But the thing is, we're going to need to make some modifications to make this the complete wave function. What else do we need here in order to really make this work as a function? What else is usually included in the wave equation? Phase. Uh, some sort of phase shift, yeah. And why is that needed? Why do we need a plus some constant there? Because we don't know where we are in the wave when we start. Yeah, we don't really have a good starting point to, to be sure of. If, and one thing to keep in mind here is if the phase shift wasn't there, if we didn't have that plus a constant, if we were to plug in 0 for x, that is the origin, and 0 for t, if you plug in 0 for x and 0 for t, you just get sine of 0. And what's sine of 0? If we were to just plug in 0, that's 0, right? Sine of 0 is 0. So if we didn't have a phase shift, every wave would be passing through height 0 when the position is zero and the time is zero. But that's not true. Waves don't all have to go through the origin at time zero. Waves could be at any height at time zero. So that means we need to have an extra term here. That term influences the initial conditions, the height of the wave at position zero time zero. And of course, the phi value isn't equal to the height of the wave, but it's a value determined by the height of the wave at time zero, position zero. And typically, that's going to be the last thing you calculate. You usually figure out everything else first and then plug in some more information and calculate phi. Uh, and also, yeah, period and wavelength. Period is going to be influencing time. Wavelength is going to be influencing position. Because how do we define those? What is, for instance, what does wavelength mean? Yeah, wavelength is the distance for one full cycle. So on a graph, you could just measure that as the distance from, for instance, from crest to the or crest to the next crest. That distance is the wavelength. You could also measure from a trough to the next trough, a low point to a low point. That's also the same distance lambda. You got to be careful if you're using points other than a crest or a trough, though, because if you measured from, let's say, from equilibrium to equilibrium. Is that one full cycle? Not quite, because in fact, that's how, that's what fraction of a cycle? Yeah, that's only half a cycle. To get a full cycle, if you're using a point other than crest or a trough, you've got to go from, like for instance, in this case, this is equilibrium on the way down versus equilibrium on the way up. Those count as different points in the cycle. 
you could measure from equilibrium on the way down to the next equilibrium on the way down. That would be one full cycle. Or you could just pick two points that you know are exactly half a cycle apart and measure that distance and double it. That would be a, a one full wavelength. But in general, lambda is the distance per cycle. And on a graph, the easiest way to measure that is just to, me to, to identify two adjacent peaks or two adjacent troughs and measure the horizontal distance between them. You can also do that from a physical picture of the wave. Like in this case, this distance from crest to crest would be the wavelength. Or if you're talking about a sound wave, maybe you've got this alternating pattern of high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. The wavelength would be the distance from high pressure zone to high pressure zone or from low pressure zone to the next low pressure zone. It's just the physical distance for one full repeating cycle. And to fill that in in the equation, you could almost think of this as a unit conversion issue. X is a distance. So that's typically going to be measured in what units? Yeah, that's going to be measured in meters. The problem is you can't take the sine of a distance. You can't take the sine of some number of meters. Sine only takes what sort of value as an input. Sign of what sort of measurement could you plug in there? Yeah, degrees or radians. You take the sign of an angle. So in order to make the sine function even work here, we need something that's going to convert distance into an angle. And that means we're going to need a conversion factor. That conversion factor is going to have to have meters in the denominator to cancel out the meters in x. And it's going to have to have radians in the numerator in order to introduce radians. What's a convenient number of radians to use as a reference? Yeah, 2 pi, because 2 pi is one full cycle worth of, of radians, whereas a wavelength is one full cycle worth of distance. So if we multiply the distance, the location on the rope, by 2 pi over lambda, meters cancel out, we introduce radians, but 2 pi and lambda both represent one full cycle. So this is like multiplying by one full cycle over one full cycle. We're not really changing how much of a cycle we're talking about, we're just changing how we're describing it. We're changing it to a radian measure that's some fraction of a full revolution, as opposed to a distance measure that's some fraction of a full wavelength. And we can do the same thing for time, except what do we call one full cycle worth of time? Yeah, that's the period. One period means the amount of time it takes for one full cycle to occur. So you'd look for that on the time graph the amount of time from peak to peak or trough to trough is the period, usually written as a capital T. Typically, we use lowercase t to represent what time it is right now and capital T to represent some period of time, some interval of time that is enough time for something interesting to happen. So the period, capital T, is the number of seconds per cycle or time per cycle. the amount of time for one full cycle to occur. So on the time versus y graph, you can get that by measuring crest to crest or trough to trough, or again, equilibrium to the next equilibrium, then double it. You can also get that by observing the physical phenomenon, not as a distance, of course, but as an amount of time. If you watch this one location as it oscillates up and down, if you time the oscillation, like let's say you notice it hits a peak and then you start your stopwatch and wait for it to go to a trough and then back to a peak again, that's one full cycle. So the amount of time it takes to go from a peak to a trough and back up to a peak is one period. Or you could also measure convenient fractions. From a peak to a trough, that's half of a cycle. So you double that amount of time and you get one full period. And you can fill that in the same way. If we multiply time by two pi over a period, that's one full cycle in radians. That's one full cycle in seconds. So those are essentially the same idea multiplied by time. Seconds and seconds cancel out. We're left with radian measure. 
So the whole point of these two multipliers is to convert time into an angle and to convert position into an angle so that all we're adding together is just radians plus radians plus radians. Although we typically use not just a plus, but a plus or minus here. We could be adding the, the position term plus the time, or time term plus position term or time term minus position term. And what's the difference there? Why would we use plus versus minus there? What do you think that would signify? Yeah, that's all about which direction the wave is moving to the left or to the right. So we choose typically plus represents that the wave is moving in the negative direction to the left and minus represents that the wave is moving in the positive direction to the right. Uh, one other thing we need here, a typical sine function, if we just grab y equals sine of anything, what's the biggest and smallest a sine function can get? If you're just graphing y equals sine of whatever, how high does it go and how low does it go? Yeah, it goes down to negative one and up to positive one. But of course, waves can go up and down as far as you want. So how could you modify the equation to make the graph stretch out vertically or compress vertically? Yeah, the idea of amplitude. We put in a multiplier here. A multiplier outside the function is going to stretch and compress vertically. Whereas these multipliers inside the function stretch and compress horizontally, adjusting the wavelength or period. And one other thing we could do also is we could add something outside the function. Usually written as y sub zero or sometimes y sub eq for equilibrium. Because just in terms of graphing, if you have some function that you graphed and then you add a constant to it, what does that plus a constant do to the graph? Like if you graph y equals x squared and then you graph y equals x squared plus five, what difference would that make? Yeah, shifts the whole graph up or down because you're calculating the y value but you take that y value and then you add a constant to it. That means you're adding that constant to every y value. So the whole graph shifts up or down if y not happens to be a negative. So this is the vertical shift term. This basically allows you to have a graph that's not oscillating around the axis. Without that, every wave is just oscillation around zero, above zero, below zero, above zero, below zero. If you want it to be a different value, like let's say for instance, a sound wave, you're oscillating pressure between a little bit below one atmosphere and a little bit above one atmosphere. So in that case, the graph would look like you've got one atmosphere. You're gonna have your oscillations above and below one atmosphere instead of above and below zero. So for that, you need a plus one atmosphere to shift the whole graph up to that new level. Any questions on that equation so far? And note that most of these terms, most of our parameters, the amplitude, the period, the wavelength, even the uh, vertical shift, you can get most of these based on either the graphs or by observing the physical behavior of the system. You can observe how long it takes to complete one full cycle. If you've got a paused video or a still photograph, you can measure the distance from crest to crest. And you can also measure the distance between equilibrium and the high point or equilibrium and the low point because that's all amplitude means. Amplitude is the distance between equilibrium and the high point. That vertical distance is the amplitude. So many of these, in fact, all of these except phase shift can be directly measured from the graphs or from observing the physical system. Phase shift, you're gonna need to solve for afterwards. Typically, once you have all the other parameters, you can just pick some point with an X value and a T value, plug it in for X and T, and then solve for phase shift as the last unknown. Any questions on that conceptually so far? And a couple other quick things we can do with the parameters here. 
Uh, one of them is an alternate way you can describe time. Instead of writing period as amount of time divided by number of cycles, you can reverse that number of cycles divided by amount of time. And what do we call that? Yeah, that's the frequency. The frequency is like the period. It's essentially the same information, just inverted. Frequency is one over period, or you could say period is one over frequency. The difference is period is talking about how much time it takes for one full cycle. The frequency is talking about how many cycles happen in one full second. So seconds per cycle versus cycles per second. They're exact reciprocals of each other by definition. And which one is more useful really depends on the circumstances. Uh, period is going to be measured in seconds because it's just amount of time and cycles is unitless. Frequency is going to be measured in one over seconds, which is also known as Hertz. One Hertz means one cycle per second. So if something is described as having a frequency of 50 Hertz, that means 50 cycles happen every second, for example. Uh, and which one you want to use is really just a matter of preference and convenience. In fact, you can even make that substitution in the wave equation itself. 2 pi divided by period could be replaced with 2 pi times frequency. So this entire term could be replaced with 2 pi times frequency times time. Because 2 pi divided by period is the same as 2 pi times frequency. Sometimes that's a more useful way of writing it out. Uh, they both work. They both do the exact same thing. It's just that sometimes one or the other is more useful or more convenient. Any questions on that so far? And one other very neat thing about how these quantities are related. If you multiply these, specifically if we multiply wavelength, which is distance per cycle times frequency, which is cycles per unit of time, what happens if we multiply those together? You get speed. Yeah, we end up with speed. Cycles and cycles cancel out. And distance over time is the definition of speed. So this tells you the wave speed, the velocity. And that is literally just how fast the wave is propagating forward. Not how fast the individual particles are moving. Like the individual pieces of rope are oscillating up and down, but not really moving forward at all. In a wave, though, what is moving forward? The particles themselves are just oscillating up and down. But what's moving forward? What is the wave motion? The disturbance itself. If you just take a rope and shake one end of it, like you just give it a pulse, that pulse travels forward. The rope itself, on average, has not moved. Each individual piece just goes up and down and then stays where it is. But the fact of being out of alignment, the fact of being in a disturbed position, is what's moving. A wave is a disturbance that can propagate outwards through space. And that disturbance can carry energy and information with it. You have to put energy into it. You have to do work to flip that end of the rope up. And that energy is carried with the disturbance. The other end of the rope might knock something over, for instance. And it carries information. You could do a certain pattern of pulses and rests, even in just, just treat that as Morse code or binary code or whatever you want to do. You can send messages with this. You can use waves to send messages by altering how you're sending the pulses. So a wave is a traveling disturbance that carries information and energy along with it. The individual particles hardly move at all, but the fact of being out of alignment is what's traveling. That's really what a wave is all about, a traveling disturbance. Any other questions on that so far?
Also on the subject of speed, if you're creating a wave, can you choose how fast it travels? Like if you're just making a sound, do I get to choose how fast that sound spreads out? Or what determines that sound or the speed? What determines how fast the sound wave travels? Yeah, that's a property of the, or de that depends on the properties of the medium. So for a sound wave, that's air. The wave is spreading out through the air. So the speed of sound in air depends on the properties of the air, specifically the density and the temperature of the air. If you've got a wave traveling in a string, then the speed is going to depend on properties of the string, specifically the tension and the density of the string. But in general, the, the speed at which the wave can travel forward, the speed at which the disturbance can propagate by making the disturbance become the next location is dependent on the properties of the material it's traveling in. The source, the thing or person or whatever creating the wave cannot choose that unless you also have the ability to modify the medium itself. However, what else can the source choose? If you're creating the wave, what do you get to pick? Yeah, you get to choose the frequency. Frequency is how many cycles per second the wave is oscillating at. If you're holding one end of the rope, you get to choose how many times you wave your hand up and down per second. So the frequency is chosen by the source. The thing or person or whatever creating the wave. And then the wavelength is kind of a combination of both. Because if you solve for wavelength, wavelength is frequency divided by speed. I'm sorry, in the way around, speed divided by frequency. The speed is determined by the medium, the frequency is chosen by the source. So the wavelength, the actual distance from crest to crest, depends on both of those combined together. So if you know what the wave speed is, you can sort of indirectly choose the wavelength by choosing a frequency that will cause the wavelength you want. But the wavelength does depend on both the medium and the source combined together. Any questions on that so far? All right, then let's see if we can put this all together into uh, an actual example with these graphs. Let me pull up some example graphs and we'll see what we can do. Uh, yeah, that should work. So here's an example of a couple of graphs, an x versus y graph and a t versus y graph. Uh, can you see those all right? It's a little blurry. OK, so let's see what we can do with these. We have uh, x versus y graph and a t versus y graph with lots of labels. So this should be enough information to get everything. And how could we do that? What are some, in, what's some information we can determine from these graphs? Yeah, we should be able to get the amplitude. In fact, let me just paste in the entire equation. The, this is our goal. We wanna find values for all of these. We want values for amplitude, period, wavelength, and phase shift. And I guess we're also going to need a y sub 0 here, because this is not uh, oscillating around the axis. So how could we find the amplitude here? How do we measure that? Can we just measure some distance from somewhere to somewhere? Uh, could you calculate the distance from the maximum to the min and then divide by two? Yeah, that's a good way to do it. 
we've got a, a minimum at looks like 10 and a maximum at 60. So the distance between them is 50 from 10 to 60. And so what would the actual amplitude be? Yeah, 25, because 50, the distance between max and min is two times the amplitude. So the amplitude should be half of that, and that is 25. And that should have units. I don't really have labels on this graph, but that's going to be presumably a distance, whatever units of measurement the y-axis has measured in. Uh, and while we're at it, can we get y naught? Can we get the equilibrium y value? Where should we expect that to be? That should be 35, right? And how can you calculate that if it's not something that is easily visible? Where do we get that 35? Yeah, you can, since we already know the amplitude is 25, you can start at the low point 10 and go up one amplitude. So from 10, the low point, add 25, and you should get to the halfway point. Or you can go in the opposite direction. From the high point, 60, you can go down by the amplitude, down 25, and you get to 35. In fact, even before you find the amplitude, the middle should just be the exact average of the high point and low point. So low point is 10, high point is 60, if you just take the average of 10 and 60, 10 plus 60 divided by two, that tells you the average, the midpoint. So the middle is 35. Everything's oscillating around 35. Uh, what about the period and wavelength? Can we find those from these graphs? For instance, how would you usually measure a wavelength? That's just the distance from, is that 11? Uh, measuring from where to where here? Um, I did it from both of the crest points. From the crest to the crest? Yes. From Because it looks like we definitely have a crest at 11. Let me uh, label that. Uh, I assume that the point at like zero meters would be a crest, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, I think we need to be careful about that because it's not really clear whether that's truly a crest or not. We definitely have a crest at x equals 11. So let me mark that. And maybe a crest, maybe not at x equals zero. Do we have another, I mean, we don't have any other crests for sure. Do we have any troughs or equilibrium points that are definitely at certain locations? Like this trough here looks like it's at what value? Yeah, it looks like that's five, halfway between four and six. So it looks like we've got a, a trough, a low point at x equals five. So from five to 11, how far is that? That's six. And that's what fraction of a wavelength if we're just going from trough to crest? Right, that's exactly half of a wavelength. So if six, presumably this is meters, six meters is half of a wavelength. So what would the wavelength be? Yeah, it should be 12 meters. And we could also do this with other fractions. If we didn't know there was a trough at x equals five, we could say maybe it looks like there's a equilibrium point at 14. You could say from 11 to 14 is three, and that's what fraction of a wavelength. If you're just going from crest to equilibrium. Yeah, crest to equilibrium is a fourth of a cycle. So you could say three meters is a fourth of a cycle, quadruple that, and you still get 12. So either way, we find the wavelength is 12. Uh, we can do the same thing with period. Are there any locations, or uh, sorry, I should say any times on the time graph that look like convenient troughs or crests or equilibrium to use? Uh, 
and it's kind of got cut off. That's supposed to be one, two, three, four on the axis. Can you identify a convenient, I mean, we certainly don't even have one full cycle here, but can you identify a convenient fraction of a cycle that we could use? Like, can you identify a pair of points that are marking off a convenient half a cycle or a convenient fourth of a cycle? Are we talking about finding the period? Uh, yeah, for the time graph. Yeah, so you could start, so if you go to the time, um, I guess if you go to the graph that's a snapshot, snapshot of x equal 10, you look at the origin and at t equal like four you can see that kind of just went from a trough to a crest i don't know if that's necessarily a trough at zero though it's difficult to tell if that really reaches the true bottom of the graph or not it looks like that's not quite all the way down to 10. but it looks like uh, we are crossing equilibrium at one. So we know that there's equilibrium at one. And where's the next equilibrium? Uh, five. Yeah, or I think that's four. Oh, four. And if we're going from equilibrium to equilibrium, that's how much of a cycle? Yeah, that's exactly half of a cycle. Because a full cycle would be from equilibrium to trough to equilibrium to crest to equilibrium. If we're just going from equilibrium to crest to equilibrium, that's half of a cycle. So we can say half of a period is from one to four, that's three seconds. Multiply by two, we get period is six seconds. So that's the period, six seconds. And it looks like now we've got everything except for the phase shift. So let's fill in what we know. I'm just gonna copy paste this whole formula and we'll fill in A is 25, period is six, wavelength is 12, Y naught is 35. And we don't know the phase shift yet, but we can solve for that later. There is one other thing we need to figure out though. What else is still unknown in this equation? the phase we don't know the phase shift but we can uh, that's the last thing we're going to be solving for but what else beyond the phase shift is unknown yeah we don't know the direction right we can't fill in or we can't choose plus or minus until we have a direction of travel and we can't solve for phi before we have that plus or minus because that's still too many unknowns in the equation so to figure out the uh phase shift to or sorry to figure out plus or minus to get an actual direction of travel we're going to need to compare both of these graphs the thing is motion, the whole idea of direction of travel, motion involves position and time. The object is changing position as time passes. So that means we're gonna to need to use both the position graph and time graph together in order to get any information about direction of travel. And so we're gonna to need to look for ideally a point that is the same on both graphs. The problem is the position graph shows all positions, but only what single time. What's the only time on the entire position graph? T equal two. Yeah, that whole graph is at T equals two seconds. So that means we're gonna to need to look for T equals two seconds on the other graph. And T equals two looks like this point right here. So this point, let me list out the coordinates of that. That point has coordinates uh, t equals two, because it's that point on the graph, x equals 10, because this entire graph is x equals 10, and y equals, kind of difficult to tell, but let's say about maybe 55. So it looks like that's the, the, the full coordinates, all the information about that point. This point on the graph is t equals two, because that's the point on the graph, x equals 10, because it says this entire graph is x equals 10, and y equals 55. 
But now we also want to find a corresponding point on the X graph. By the same token, we can say that the entire X graph, sorry, the entire T graph is at X equals 10. So we want to look for X equals 10 on the X graph because the X graph shows all positions, but we specifically care about X equals 10. So looking at X equals 10, looks like we've got this point right here. If we list out the coordinates of this point, we can say that that point has coordinates X equals 10, because this entire graph is, or this point is 10 on the X axis. T equals, what's the T value for this entire graph? Yeah, two seconds. And Y value looks like it's a little below 60. Let's round that off to 55. Let me use a different color for that actually. That might be more visible. So these two points, even though they look different on the two different graphs, those two points have the same coordinates. We can actually use this to figure out the direction of travel now that we've established the same point on both graphs. And let me make that a little smaller. So this point on the X graph and this point on the Y on the T graph are really the same point, just labeled differently. To figure out what's happening next though, because this is still just one point on the graph. This is saying at X equals 10 and two seconds, the Y value is 55. But from there, we want to know what's happening next. We don't really care so much that it's at, five, at y equals 55 right now. How can we figure out what's happening next? Can we look at uh, a position at a time later? 10 later, ideally, yes. We want to know what's happening to this x equals 10 point later on. But later on implies we're allowing time to pass. If we want some time to pass, we can take a look at the time graph. Because the time graph, is, it might be useful to think of this, like on the X graph, these two directions are like to the left and to the right or forward and backward. But on the time graph, this axis is not left and right. What are the directions on the time axis? If we're going into the increasing T direction, we're really traveling not into the, not forward or to the right or to the left or whatever. We're traveling into the, what does increasing T mean? Or what does decreasing T mean? Up and down would be more on the y-axis, but the time axis, if you're increasing time, you're going into the future. If you're decreasing time, you're looking into the past. So the time axis, it's best to think of these directions, not as left and right or forward and backward, but as past and future. The negative t direction is the past. The positive t direction is the future. So if we wanna know what's happening next, we take a look at this instant in time, two seconds, and look a little bit into the future. If we look a little bit into the future, if we allow some time to pass, would you say this point on the rope is on its way up or on its way down? Yeah, looks like this is on its way up. Traveling into the future means the graph is going up because this is a positive slope. Or you can look at it in terms of go a little bit into the future, let me make this smaller going a little bit into the future is gonna to correspond to going up to stay on the graph. So forward into the future on the time graph corresponds to going up in this particular case. Might be up or down, you have to check for each graph. But we at least know that at two seconds, the location X equals 10 is on its way up. Now, if we go back to the position graph, we can still say this point is on its way up. And now we need to figure out if on its way up means the graph is moving to the left or to the right. And there are several ways to look at this. One way I find it useful to just sketch out or imagine the shape of the graph. So if we just imagine the graph itself could be sliding left or right. 
Because keep in mind that point is not moving left or right at all. That point on the rope is just oscillating up and down. But the whole graph is either sliding to the left or sliding to the right. And watch closely. If I try sliding this graph to the left versus if I try sliding this graph to the right, which one of those would allow this point to move up? Yeah, if I slide this graph to the left, then this point gets shoved upwards because that point on the graph is now higher up. Whereas if I try sliding this graph to the right, then this point is now going to go downwards, dropping down to the new level of the graph. So the graph has to be moving, the, the graph itself, the wave motion has to be moving to the left to make this point move up. It's also helpful, I think, to look at this in terms of crests and troughs. For this to move up, you want the nearest crest to be moving towards it. The nearest crest is over here at x equals 11. The nearest crest has to move to the left to cause this point to be, the point at 10 to be pushed up. So we know this graph is moving to the left. In other words, the negative x direction. What does that tell you about the plus or minus sign here? Yeah, wait, actually it's moving to the left. So that's gonna have to be plus. There's sort of an opposite effect going on here. As time passes, the position is decreasing. X is getting smaller and smaller. So an increase in time corresponds to a decrease in position. That means we actually need plus here so the increase and decrease balance each other out. Whereas if the wave was moving to the right, time would be increasing and position would be increasing. So we need a minus. So the increase and increase balance each other out. But in general, wave moving to the left means you need a, a plus here. Wave moving to the right means you need a minus here. So we now have the entire equation except for the phase shift. And at that point, you can just choose any location on either graph plug in x, t, and y values and solve for phi. And I would recommend using a crest or a trough. For example, a convenient trough to use would be this point right here. Uh, let's say x equals five. We've got a trough at x equals five. So what you could do is you could plug in five for x, plug in two for t, because the whole graph is at t equals two, and also plug in 10 for y. And then the only unknown left is phi, so you can solve that for phi using an inverse sign or arc sign. And that'll be the phi value. You plug that in and you've got your entire wave equation. Any other questions on that? All right, if you wanna get some more practice on this, I've got a uh, worksheet of more wave equation stuff at math.andcheese.org. If you go to math.andcheese.org slash P7C, there should be a uh, worksheet with some graphs of wave. Just here's some graphs of waves, find the equations. So give that a try. Uh, let me know if you uh, have any other questions for next time by email and I will see you there.